God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, goes to the higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God.
never-ending, never-giving-up love for us. We thank you so, so, so much. And Father, we thank you for our young ones. We thank you for Eva and all she means to us. And we pray now for Sunday Club and for Margaret and Sam as they go out this morning. Be with them, inspire them. And we pray that Eva will grow up strong in her love of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh. We yeah, we will need to sit down. Andy is, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting carried away. I just want to carry on singing. <laughs> Andy, would you come up and lead prayers? <laughs> There are a couple of events this week that are likely to do that prayer, so I'll include those uh, at the end. One is the Prisoner Sunday today, you must pray there. Uh, and also on Tuesday, the 10th, it's the World uh, Mental Health uh, Day, so I can include a couple of prayers that have been written for those at the end. So let us pray. <coughs> Loving God, we come to you as your church, party of the body of worldwide believers, each of us so very different, yet drawn together through our faith in Jesus. We pray for those Christians who are struggling right now, for whom life is challenging and who, without their faith in you, would have no hope. We pray, Lord, for those Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith or displaced by conflict. We pray today particularly for those in Nagorno-Karabakh, for thousands of hungry and traumatised Christian families who have fled recently to Armenia as a result of the invasion by Azerbaijan. We ask that those in power have a change of heart towards Christians and a new compassion. We pray for supernatural strength, hope and joy for persecuted believers and their families. We ask, Lord, to bless the work of the charities such as Barnabas and Open Doors to encourage and strengthen new believers coming to faith in such a difficult context. God of community, we pray for our church and for our community on Hailing and its surroundings, for all those who worship and witness here. We pray for strength and wisdom and for your guiding spirit to be upon all who step out in faith to proclaim your loving kindness in these places. We pray too, Lord, for the health and well-being, physical, mental and spiritual, and for their families as they too make sacrifices. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them with times of rest, joy and laughter that carry them through the challenges they will each face in daily life and ministry. We pray for all of those who come through the doors of this church and we ask that whatever the reason they come in, they will encounter the peace and love that comes only from you. <laughs> Father of justice, we pray for the leaders of all nations and especially for the government of this country we pray that there will be work done that goes beyond the headlines and sound bites, that difficult decisions will be made, that will work for the benefit of the majority. We pray for fairness for all people and wisdom in how public money should be allocated and spent. Lord of all creation, we give you thanks for the world you have created 
and entrusted into our care. We know that over time we have made careless environmental mistakes, the ripples of which are being felt often by the most vulnerable. We pray that you will enter the hearts of those who govern and make decisions so that we can reduce and reverse the damage that has been done to this beautiful planet. Lord, we ask you to speak into the hearts of each of your people. Encourage each of us to make changes that although may seem small and insignificant, will collectively bring about positive change so that we can live our lives in ways that reflect our love for you in our care of creation. God of healing and love, we bring before you those who are suffering either in mind, body or spirit and ask you to bring comfort in times of pain and worry and despair. Lord of all hope, we pray for those who are coming towards the end of their earthly lives. Hold out your loving hand and guide them to your glory. We pray for those who have died in recent days and give thanks for those we know who have blessed our lives or that of this church. Lord, comfort those who mourn the loss of someone they love so deeply or who are reminded of a special anniversary. A prayer for Prison Sunday. Lord, you offer freedom to all people. We pray for those in prison. Break the bonds of fear and isolation that exist. Support with your love prisoners and their families and friends, prison staff and all who care for them. Give wisdom and compassion to those who work in the criminal justice system, legislators, the police, probation services, social services, volunteers. They may exercise their responsibilities wisely and compassionately. Heal those who have been wounded by the activities of others, especially the victims of crime or witnesses. Help us to forgive one another to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly together with Christ in his strength and in his spirit, now and every day. Amen. Amen. A prayer for World Mental Health Day. God of compassion, you created us to be both fragile and ordinary. Silence the voices that say we are not good enough, haven't achieved enough, haven't enough to show for our lives, that we are not enough. Help us to know that we are treasure. We are prized. We are cherished. We are loved infinitely by you. So be with us in our roller coaster of feelings. When our hearts are in downward free fall, be with us. When our minds race with anxiety, be with us. When our throats close in fear, be with us. When sleep will not come, be with us. In the name of Jesus, who knew trauma, abuse, despair and abandonment, and has nothing but love for us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Andy obviously mentioned that um, there has been a death in his prayers, but for those of you who don't know, um, Mike Smith went to be with our Lord on Monday afternoon, and we can rejoice, obviously, that he's now in heaven with the Lord, and he's having a whale of a time, but obviously we need to remember the family who are grieving the loss of such a wonderful man, and we've got a lot to be grateful for, for Mike, because he was the one who went to Jack Walker and said, there's so many of us going to Lee Park, why don't we plant a church on Hayling Island? So, Father God, we thank you for Mike and all he means to us. We thank you for his life and all the seeds that he's sown throughout his life. And Father, we pray that you would continue uh, to water those seeds as they grow. 
Um, Father, we pray for Jean and the whole family, for Steve and Marlis and the grandchildren and all the in-laws. Um, there are so many, Lord, who are grieving the loss of such a very special man. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring them comfort, you would bring them peace, and that each one of them would know your loving arms wrapped around them, bringing them your comfort. In Jesus' name. to meet together, even when maybe our bodies, our minds are holding us back from coming, coming into a place with other Christians. But thank you, Holy Spirit, that you can release us from fear. We can accept you as our saviour. We can say we are born again and we are no longer slaves to fear. You do release us from the chains of bondage 
that you open the doors for us to come into this beautiful family where your love abounds where we discover your promises where we hear about the assurance of your salvation and Father when our loved ones pass on to your presence when they've accepted you as a saviour we can say hallelujah what assurance of salvation so Father enable us to hear your word today as our sister Annie brings it to us as we're exposed to your truths and your promises settle your word upon our hearts when we dwell in your peace we say this in and through the name of Jesus Amen, Amen. Please take a seat Jesus is Lord today. Amen. 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 Over everything. The title of the sermon today in the series on Philippians, which we're enjoying, and thank you for all the previous speakers who've enhanced our understanding of that book. I hope a hundredfold. And uh, it was Richard's idea that we should study a book. And I think we've all benefited from the continuity of that, that thought and that understanding. So the title of my sermon today is Authentic <coughs> Care. Now sometimes some of the other speakers <coughs> would agree with me that sometimes we puzzle a little bit over the titles <laughs> of the sermons. Um, but usually when we dig in, we get to what I believe is God's truth in the matter. So the reading today is, and after the words authentic care, um, put down Timothy, because that's who we're going to look at today. And uh, I'm going to read... Philippians 2, verses 19 to 24, and luckily today I'll actually have it in a bookmark, so I'm not <laughs> scrambling about looking for it, as I have been in the past. Um, and I'm reading from the King James Version. So, chapter 2, verses 19, and this is Paul writing to, to Timothy writing to the church, rather, about Timothy. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But we know the proof of him, that's Timothy, that as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. From him therefore, I hope to send you presently, <coughs> as soon as I shall see how it will go with me. Remember, Paul is in prison at this time. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Now, 
I'm going to look at the words authentic care and unpack them separately so that we can find their meaning a little bit better and have a better understanding of what they mean. Authentic and care. Looking at definitions, I love definitions. When I was teaching at the university, I always gave extra marks for students who provided definitions of some of the terms they were discussing. And see what they mean in practice. So this is not just a theoretical journey we take this morning, but a practical one for us as the family of God. I'm going to begin with a question. All philosophers ask lots of questions. And sometimes it's the asking of the questions rather than the finding of the answers that is important. So I'm going to ask you a question. You don't need to put your hand up or respond, but just think about it. When you looked in the mirror this morning, who did you see? Okay. <laughs> Groans from the back. <laughs> was it the real you? Or one wearing a familiar mask? Some writers refer to that this as the false self. We all wear masks at times for lots of reasons. Here are some. For the sake of fear of revealing our real self. For the sake of the approval of others. For convenience. For disguise. And for perhaps the saddest of all, distaste of ourselves. I had a friend I helped in the 90s to put together a course for women um, called Who Are You? And we covered all ranges of a woman's life, including her makeup, her clothes, the way she expressed herself. One of the first exercises that my friend gave to the people in the group, and they were believers and unbelievers in this group, was to bring with them a small hand mirror and look into that mirror and say, using their name, I love you, Annie. You can't believe how hard that was for so many people in that group. Some could not even do that at all. Some shied away from it. So when I say, who is the real you, I want to remind you of James, who in his letter, uh, chapter two, or is it one? Yeah, chapter one, verses 23 and 24, said that we look at ourselves in a mirror and then walk away and forget completely who we are. Just think on that. Another question. Do you know the you that God knows? The real you. Do you know that? We've just sung about God loves us so much. Do you know when you look in the mirror the you that God knows? So it's most important in our lives as believers that we know who we are. So what is the definition of authentic? The dictionary says this. Here's some of the words. Genuine. Real. Worthy of trust. And I love this next one. Having an undisputed origin. Mm -hmm. Having an undisputed origin. Some of you will have watched the Antiques Roadshow or other similar programs where 
The piece of art is to be proven whether it's fake or real. And uh, we watch to the end to find out whether the people standing there have a real treasure or whether they have something worth 20 pence or something <laughs> that they found at a car boot sale. So in any work of art, <coughs> They have to prove the undisputed origin of that piece. It's called provenance. That you prove that it's real and where it came from. Now, you know, as believers, we have an undisputed origin. Almighty God. For in God we live and move and have our being. And John's Gospel tells us that God lights every soul born into this world. All the babies born today, in this hour, have God's light shining upon them, wherever they come from. Proven, that's another word for authentic. Proven. Another word is valid. From the Greek word authentikos. Sometimes now, when I look in the mirror in the natural, I see my mother, Jessie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an age thing, isn't it? <laughs> and some of you, I think, can identify with that. That's not a bad thing, for Jessie was a warm, loving person <coughs> who only ever showed me deep love and care, right to the end of her life. Even my two sons, Jonathan and Benjamin, often say to me, oh, mum, that's just like grandma when you said that, or did that. So now let's turn to what our definition of care is. So I hope you understand a little bit more about that word authentic or authenticity. It means to be truly true to your origin. And I hope we all agree that our origin is in God and remains in God forever. So let's look at care. So what is the definition of care? And think of this as we think of ourselves as carers for each other within this fellowship. It means to pay attention to, to have solicitude for, that is a loving care, watching over, protection over, supervision over, conscientiousness and perseverance in caring, needfulness, heedfulness, sorry, heedfulness for needfulness, <laughs> concern and to have a regard for. Let's go back to Jessie for a moment. She was a lovely woman, but by her own admission, a chronic warrior. <clears throat> when I chided her once about her constant worry about us all, she said, and some of you may identify with this, Anne, our Anne, as we say in the North, if I don't worry, it seems to me that I don't care. Think about that for a minute. How many times in the Bible are we told not to worry? Fear or be anxious about anything? They say that there are 365 words in the Bible that tell us to fear not. One for each day of the year. And I don't know about leap year, but anyway. <laughs> Jesus himself said this, I would have you without carefulness. <coughs> That's how he wants us to be. Carefree. One reference in, Bi in the Bible says like, new calves skipping in their stall. I love that picture. When did you skip last? <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> Care 
genuine care for others doesn't shift into worry. That's what we have to be aware of. Or fear or anxiety. The other trap is when care shifts into control or even intimidation. When we exercise care over someone, we have to be careful that we're not attempting to control them. I myself recognize this trap sometimes in myself, and it can be manifest in us, often as parents. My friend Lynn in California, who is a true friend of mine, and knows me very well, says of me, Annie likes all her ducks in a row. That sort of describes me, at least in my mind. I may not appear orderly to some of you <coughs> in other areas, but in my mind, I like order <coughs> and predictability. I'm not very good at spontaneity. You see, I'm being authentic now. I'm telling you some of my secrets. You may be the same. I like to fix things, to make things fit to my pattern, and that includes people. Perhaps you're the same. But of course, we know that we cannot fix anyone. Come on, we can't even fix ourselves. We are not in charge. That's really hard for some of us to listen to and hear this morning. We are not in charge. We can't be someone's savior. There's only ever one of those, and his name is Jesus. When I find that my caring is Evolving into worry or control, I do this. This is a strategy I use, so I'm passing it on to you to accept or reject. Imagine you're a child at school and in the cloakroom you have a peg. I'm not sure if they still have pegs, Anne, but they do. She's nodding yeah, there, do. so that's good. Because <laughs> I know I'm, I was at school a long, long time ago. But I remember my peg in the cloakroom. And I was told, Anne, this is your peg, and no one else's. Everything you own has to go on this peg until you go home. And um, on that peg, there was my coat, um, my shoe bag with my pumps in it. I'm using a, a northern expression there. And, um, and your school bag and everything else that was yours. And that peg belonged to you. It was your peg. Sometimes it even had your name on it. Now I imagine that God has a peg, and, or a hook, and he, so when I find myself obsessing or stressing about something or someone, I transfer it from my peg to God's peg. Okay. I even mime it. I think of something or someone and I picture it and I see it on my peg and I move it from my peg and I put it on God's peg. And now it's his responsibility. and he takes on the responsibility for it, and I leave the outcome to him. There's no safer place to put something or someone except onto God's peg. It's an act of surrender. And boy, that's hard sometimes, isn't it? It's hard when the person we hold so dear we take off our peg and we put it on God's peg. And it works. 
It brings a release of peace. Now let's look at the next section of this sermon, which is on the authentic relationship in the life of the Apostle Paul and his son Timothy. Who was Timothy? He is first mentioned in Acts 16.1, and I found at least 12 other references to him in Acts and the Epistles. It seems he was converted under Paul's teaching, and of course he has two epistles of his own, 1st and 2nd Timothy, uh, written to him by Paul. He, Paul refers to him as his son in the faith, a minister of God, an apostle, a bond slave, a fellow labourer, and deeply beloved. <coughs> his father was Greek, his mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, were Jewish. And as many of you know, the, the line of Jewishness passes through the mother. And he was instructed by both these women in the Holy Scriptures from childhood. Remember, this refers to the Torah and the Tanakh, the Jewish Scriptures. There was no New Testament at this time. Just to remind you. <laughs> Paul says of him that he belonged from birth to righteousness. How lovely that is. Oh, the power, listen to me, mums and grandmas. Oh, the power of praying mums and grandmas. Let's hear it for them. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Never forget that. Paul circumcised him as a young man, to accommodate the Jews who they were attempting to reach with the gospel, so he would have complete acceptance by them. Paul often referred to himself and Timothy as slaves or bond servants of Jesus Christ. We sang today, I'm no longer a slave to fear. We're not, but we are a slave, a bond slave to Jesus Christ. We are a servant of the Most High God. One definition of a slave is to serve as an underling. Who wants to be an underling? <laughs> Not many hands going on. Okay. To minister in a priestly service. Well, I can say that today because I'm a priest. <laughs> and once I was at... Um, is um, Tel Aviv Airport, and uh, the guard there didn't like the look of me, <laughs> and she didn't like the look of my picture, which was exactly how I was looking that day. She kept saying, no, 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 no. All my party had gone through, I was just there. Okay. So I, they're waving to me and going, what's going on? So she called, she said, do you have any other idea, <coughs> ID? Well, I did, I had my university ID on. And the way that was put on was Patricia, which is my first name, and then Anne were on there. <coughs> and then at the bottom, on the third line, it said priest. She said, ah, she's a Cohen, she's a Cohen. Get her through, get her through, get her through. <laughs> And that's an absolutely true story. <laughs> so I'm a Cohen because I'm a priest. And someone's also said because my maiden name is Lever, I'm also a Levite. So I'm a priest and a Levite standing here. And all Levites are teachers, basically. Two, two weeks ago, Pastor Richard spoke on the mind of Christ. Very movingly. I think you'll agree that was a wonderful word from him. And we are to have to embrace the same attitude as mindset and mindset as Jesus. We are all servants of one another. Jesus said, if you want to be a leader, 
You need to be a servant. And in John 13, we're given a picture of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. This would normally have been done by a lowly household servant. But Jesus, and I love this phrase in the um, King James, Jesus, knowing who he was, knowing where he came from, and knowing where he was going to, took a towel and a bowl and washed their feet. He was so totally secure in who he was. He was the real thing. He was the real deal. He was the authentic man. A mensch, as they say in Yiddish, a real man. Okay. And he washed the disciples' feet, even against the protests of Peter. And remember, he also washed the feet of Judas, his betrayer. He said then, I've given you a pattern to follow. You must wash one another's feet. In the passage that I read earlier, Paul speaks of Timothy as like no other man who will care for them in the same way that Paul does himself. He says, we are like-minded. Let's just unpack that phrase for a minute. He is not indifferent like some others who are only attending to their own agendas. Like the hireling in John chapter 10. But like Jesus himself, the good and faithful shepherd. The word translated into chapter 20 as like-minded is the only use of that word in the whole new, of the New Testament. That's interesting. It means of a similar or of the same kind. It's the Greek word ipsosukos, harmoniously together. There's a harmonious union there. And in verse 21, similarly, there is a meaning of watching over and looking after, giving attention to, taking heed of, and here's another interesting Strong's reference to this word. It says, when you care, you're taking care, you're taking aim to care. It's the picture of an arrow going to a target. So when you care for something, you're taking aim at the target with your care. In 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul says to him, Timothy, and this is a translation I found recently called the Mirror Translation, which is interesting, which relies on the, on the Greek. As my close associate and travel companion, you fully participated in everything my teaching and life proclaim. You share my resolve, my belief, my fortitude, my love, and my perseverance. What a wonderful testimony that is to Timothy. And then in that same translation, uh, the writer translates it as, we are dovetailed together. Dovetailed. I'm going to expand on that in a minute. We resonate and echo each other. Your life mirrors mine, and mine mirrors Christ's. What a wonderful testimony. I love that word in the translation, dovetailed. It's a carpentry term. Do we have any carpenters here or woodworkers today? It's a carpentry term which would have been very familiar to Jesus himself as he worked in the carpenter's shop. Here's a definition. And I don't fully understand all these words because I'm certainly not a carpenter. But it's a fan-shaped tenon that forms a tight interlocking joint when fitted into a corresponding mortise. Connecting and combining precisely and harmoniously. Amen. <coughs> to combine into a unified whole. <coughs> 
That was Paul and Timothy. What a picture of the church in unity. What a picture of us as a family. He said also of Timothy, what you have also witnessed at first hand, all my persecutions. So you know, when you're combined with someone, you suffer with them, don't you? God, the word tells us to laugh with those who laugh and weep with those who weep. And I'm sure we've been doing that this week as we think of Mike and Jean. You've been through, you've seen my hardships. And then he says this, anyone who determines to live a life entwined with Jesus Christ will be persecuted. They've suffered together as we do as a caring family. People speak of this church as Hailing Island Baptist Church as a friendly church, a place of real care and concern for its members, demonstrating practical care, physical care, spiritual care, compassion, love and help. For the two and a half years I've been here in this church, I can absolutely testify to that. And we have a pastor, Richard, and his wife, Pam, who demonstrate all these qualities. For that, we are supremely grateful. Mm -hmm. Truly, the example starts at the top. Finally, I want to mention the exhortation, again from the Mirror Translation, that he gives for 2 Timothy 4.2, and uh, take this word to ourselves today. Not just us who stand at the front here, but all of us. Broadcast this word on every occasion, even when it doesn't seem to be convenient or appropriate. Give evidence to this message. Value every individual in the audience. Highly esteem people's authentic identity passionately and teach tirelessly and all the glory goes to God. Amen. My two words today are be authentic. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Annie. That was wonderful, as ever. Andy, there's a little picture that should be um, there somewhere. Yeah. This little car really touched my heart this um, on Friday. I go to Chris's church and help with the food bank there. And this time of year, Harvest Festival. It, you know, all the schools are having harvest festivals, all the churches are having harvest festivals, and loads of them are um, donating to the food bank at the church. And so, oh, Friday morning, there was hundreds of bags that needed emptying, and I'm emptying this food, trying to put it in the right place, and then came across this by a kind kid, <laughs> and it's for your child, so they're obviously hoping that the parent takes this out. It says, hello, I hope you have fun with the toys. I wish you had this, ca this car one day, and I'm assuming a big car that they <laughs> can have. And it just touched my heart so much that I thought, oh, this little kid obviously was helping their parent pack a bag, and thought, well, the kids aren't gonna want food, aren't they? What can I give them? And 
you know, the, from the kindness of their heart, put in this little car. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to look on the school, like have a look at like what they're like. And there was um, a letter from the head teacher. And the end of it was, we foster a sense of stewardship, inspiring children to be the change they want to see in the world, serving God by serving others. And I thought, wow, that's a bit like our strap line, isn't it? Hailing Island Baptist Church, making a difference. And that spurred me on to think, you know, like, are we making a difference? That's what we want to do, isn't it? And <coughs> the songs that we're going to sing um, now, I just use them as prayers. They're quite simple. They've got simple tunes and simple words. But actually, they're awesome what they're saying. And they could radically change your hearts if you actually mean them. So you might want to stay seated, you might want to stand, you might want to kneel, however you feel comfortable. Let's use these words as prayers.
your glory. 